Well, it's been just over a month, but better late than never, right? God, if that's how I'm starting this one, how am I going to start Retribution and Legacy of Onyx? Bad jokes aside, on June 26th, author Matt Forbeck once again graced us with a story following the deeds of ODST turned Spartan Edward Buck. Set immediately after the events of Halo 5 Guardians, this book gives us a look at the galaxy in the wake of Cortana's takeover, while also telling a personal character story. So, exactly what you'd expect as a follow-up to New Blood. Before we dive in, I want to note that I was given a free copy of this book, so take that into consideration when I give my thoughts. As always, heavy spoilers ahead. If you want my spoiler-free wrap-up, skip to the timecode on screen or look in the description box. For everyone else, this is Halo Bad Blood. Like New Blood, this book is presented as a debrief or an archival recording of some kind. In fact, there's actually an archivist note that references Buck's previous account codenamed New Blood. I think I've said before that I like when stories or pieces of media have some in-universe counterpart. New Blood was already presenting itself as something of a debrief, but I love this one-off reference to it here. Anyway, our story opens pretty much right where Halo 5 ended. Osiris and Blue Team stuck on Genesis. Despite what the ending of Halo 5 may have indicated, Exuberant doesn't seem to have full control of Genesis. That, or she has no way of easily getting rid of the thousands of Promethean soldiers still present. But from there, we get a look at how Osiris and Blue Team get to Sun Helios, and as one would figure, to Infinity. Finding an intact enough pelican, the Spartans have Exuberant open a portal from Genesis to Sun Helios, our favorite monitor staying behind. When they get to Sun Helios, it's dark and evident that a Guardian likely hid it. They decide to return to Nusra, the place the Arbiter used for a staging area prior to the attack on Sunayan in Halo 5, figuring it's a good place to start looking. And as we know, that's exactly where they find him, along with Halsey and Commander Palmer. As luck would have it, Halsey had already made contact with Infinity via the plethora of Forerunner technology in the area, which makes sense given Halsey's level of genius. What's really surprising is that technically, Roland reached out to Halsey. More accurately, after Infinity fled Earth, Roland figured that Halsey would be smart enough to figure out how to receive his message. At first, this can seem a little too convenient, it certainly did to me, but it's explained that Lasky knew he'd need Halsey for the fight against Cortana, so one of his priorities was to try and recover her from Sun Helios. By 2558, the UNSC would be at least somewhat knowledgeable of Sun Helios' wealth of Forerunner artifacts, and Roland and Halsey worked together a bit in Spartan Ops, so I could imagine the two of them working this out. Basically, Roland took a shot in the dark with this communication attempt, and Halsey was smart enough to receive it. A bit convenient, sure, but I think acceptable given the players involved. Anyway, after waiting a night for Infinity to arrive, during which John apparently spends some time catching up with the Arbiter, and everyone gets to enjoy some good old Sangheili country cooking, the Spartans and Halsey return to Infinity, where they encounter another coincidence. Veronica Dare, Buck's sweetheart, is on board. Now, there are a couple major coincidences throughout this book, and this is the first one in my opinion. How exactly did Dare get on board? Blue Team and Osiris only did so because a few stars aligned. What miracle did Dare have to pull out of her ass? I could imagine maybe that she had put some clues together. Black Box certainly did, but he's an AI. Whatever the case, it's never explained and just there to kind of kick the story off. On board, Buck and Veronica spend some quote-unquote personal time together, after which she informs him of a new mission the UNSC has for them, them and Alpha 9. Buck is confused at first since Romeo is the only remaining active member of Alpha 9, but is upset when he realizes what Veronica meant. Not just Romeo, but Mickey too. As Dare details, Oni wants to reach out to the United Rebel Front, or the Front for short, and form an alliance against the created. To do that, they want someone who, as Buck puts it later on, speaks traitor. Buck is reluctant to even consider it, but eventually Veronica gets him on board and they immediately depart. From here until about halfway through the book, it's a planet-hopping galaxy tour as Buck and Veronica pick up people they need to make their plan work, while also giving readers a look at what a post-created galaxy looks like, and honestly, this is some of my favorite stuff in the book. We get a few hints at the start when we see Sunayan has gone dark in the time between Osiris leaving and their return, and we hear about Earth, possibly the entire soul system, being on lockdown. If you remember Halo 5, you'll recall Exuberant Witness noting that Guardians are meant to patrol entire star systems. But of course, the big detail is one we actually see in Halo 5 itself, along with some other post-Halo 5 media, 
ships being hit by a Guardian's attenuation pulse. As one would expect, those not far enough in space fell to the planets below, killing God knows how many. But anyway, Buck and Veronica depart on their mission, being given a slipspace capable condor to get around and make for the Ungoy homeworld of Balaho as their first destination. Why you ask? To make their first recruitment, Romeo, who had been stationed there to act as security for UNSC diplomats. And in typical Romeo fashion, it was because he slept with an admiral's daughter. Upon arriving at Balaho, rather than a guardian like on many planets, we find Forerunner ships ferrying supplies to the surface. Some of these details were actually known about thanks to background lore presented in cannon fodder articles in the years following Halo 5's release, but it's nice to have them centralized in a book, much easier for the average fan to access. First thing the two head for is the capital of Gedgau, with Buck trying to raise Romeo on comms. Luckily, this works. Unfortunately, Romeo is on the run from an army of Promethean soldiers and Ungoy. Veronica and Buck immediately head to Romeo's location and extract him. Thankfully, with the Ungoy grounding their aircraft to comply with Cortana's edict, no air resistance is present. Once on board, Romeo and Buck have a little bit of catching up, including filling him in on the mission. Before they get to it, however, Romeo asks that they save the diplomats. Veronica is reluctant due to the risk and time it would take, but it doesn't take much for her and Buck to get on board. The team find the diplomats being escorted through the streets by some kind of Covenant vehicle, or maybe an amalgamation of Covey vehicles, and a pair of goblins. With some difficulty, Buck and Romeo manage to take both of them out, even getting one to fire a salvo of needles into the other in the process. Oddly though, Buck makes a comment about never having seen an Ungoy with their mask off. We just spent almost an entire game with Buck fighting mini Krogan with half their face exposed, so I'm hard pressed to understand what the author's intent was with this line. But regardless, with the goblins down, Buck and Romeo return to the vehicle they were escorting, but unfortunately the diplomats were killed by debris from a pair of explosions. With their mission failed, the Spartans return to the Condor and leave Balaho. Like most Covenant planets, Balaho has been something of a mystery, only really briefly seen in an H2A terminal and briefly described here and there in books and ancillary material. Here we get a description of Covenant architecture on the planet, but also what native Ungoy architecture looks like. As it turns out, the Ungoy originally dug burrows underground to avoid predators, and their pre-Covenant architecture reflects this. The Ungoy were a tier 4 civilization, meaning just coming about to an industrial age, and the state of their pre-covenant architecture and their history reflects that beautifully. With Romeo gathered, the next stop is Luna to pick up Quick to Adjust, better known to fans as Virgil. Now this is definitely one of the most interesting moments in the book, since it's about as close as we get to seeing the situation on Earth. Although in some ways, it's worse than Earth. Unlike many UNSC colonies, Luna isn't terraformed. People live in domes with artificially maintained environments. We saw in Halo 5 what that meant for Earth, so you can probably guess what that would mean for a colony like Luna. As you and Buck guessed, Luna was hit by a Guardian and went dark, meaning all the environmental systems shut down and everyone is dead. Still, the team proceeds on the off chance that Virgil may have survived. Their target is a secret Oni base built sometime around 2556 and housing a number of Huragak kept there mainly after security concerns arose following the Talitza incident in Halo New Blood. Buck worries that Cortana might have known about it, but Veronica points out that it was built when Cortana was gone, and she certainly didn't have time to find out about it when she popped back up in 2557. Buck then brings up the possibility of an Oni AI telling her about it. Well, Veronica reveals that no Oni AI joined Cortana, or at least none that were known of, as Romeo points out. In the short story Rossback's World from Halo Fractures, BB anticipates Cortana's uprising and had himself and all the AI at Oni's Bravo 6 facility on Earth stored away, given to Sarah and Osmond's care and the Admiral and Lord Hood ferried off to the titular world. It's not too much of a stretch, I think, to imagine that BB might have taken precautions to prevent these Huragak from falling under Cortana's control, along with other Oni secrets, either in the same manner he did for the Bravo 6 AI or through some other means. Though, I do hope that 343 isn't expecting us to buy that no Oni AI decided to join Cortana. That would be a stretch too far. Although, we do learn a little later on that Armagers are found in the facility, so someone probably told Cortana, thus an Oni AI probably joined her, making this entire aside entirely pointless. Anyway, they make their way to the Luna facility where they find the main vehicle bay open and vacant of air. Making their way past debris, vehicles, and frozen bodies, Buck and Romeo find an airlock manually cycle it and get inside. 
Not long after they encounter a Huragok known as Likely to List, who takes them to Quick to Adjust, aka Virgil. They inform the Huragok of their mission, and Virgil agrees to help only once the Spartans have rescued Sadie from a detachment of Armagers that took her and the other human survivors. Though they could physically force Virgil to accompany them, they could never force him to do what they need him to do, so with reluctance, Buck and Romeo agree to help. It isn't long before they find Sadie and the other humans in the facility's observation deck. Veronica uses the condor to shoot out a few windows near the soldiers, which gets them sucked into space just before the safety shields kick in. With the hostages safe, the majority of them are brought to the area where the Huragak were hiding out, while Sadie, Buck, and Romeo meet up with Virgil near one of the facility's hangar bays. While Buck and Romeo had been rescuing, Virgil had been repairing, restoring power to one of the bays. As we learned earlier, damage done by a Guardian can be repaired given time. We've known for a while that the attenuation pulse used by Guardians isn't an EMP, so it doesn't really fry electronic components, and this just further solidifies that. I can't help but wonder if the pulse maybe drains a power source of its power. But whatever the case, with the Hurgok secured, everyone, including Sadie, boards the Condor and they leave for their next destination, the Spartan Training Facility, to pick up their final package, Trader Spartan Michael Crespo, aka Mickey. Unlike when Buck and Romeo had been training there, a smart AA now helped run the facility, one appropriately named Leonidas, who takes the form of a red Spartan helmet with eyes concealed by the helmet's shadow. Veronica notes that they have been trying to raise the station, but have only been getting responses from Leonidas. When asked about June, Leonidas would say that the Spartan III was indisposed. So, Leo joined the created. As the crew arrives at the Spartan training facility, Buck takes control of the Condor while everyone else hides in the troop bay. As revealed earlier in the book, the Condor's bay has a bunch of cloaking tech so no one can detect anyone or anything within. So, as Buck approaches, he appears to be alone. He contacts Leonidas, telling the AI that he was sent by the UNSC to check up on the training station. Leonidas lets Buck in, having little other choice. Interesting side note, Leonidas is said to have been created from the brain of someone from the first class of Spartan IVs, killed by their augmentations. Given all that we've seen of the Spartan IV program and their augmentations, I'm guessing Leonidas' donor was from the quote-unquote original Spartan IV program, the one that produced Ilsa Zane. The augmentations given to those candidates were known to be deadly, whereas those given to the final program candidates are pretty safe as far as we've seen. Once inside, Buck departs the Pelican from the cockpit rather than the bay, keeping his helmet on so he can secretly remain in radio contact with everyone else. Leonidas soon appears and asks how he can help Buck. Buck first asks after June, though Leonidas claims the commander is indisposed, sleeping after being awake for several days following the business with Cortana. Buck plays along, asking to then see Mickey. After some light questioning, Leonidas promises to make the arrangements, and Buck heads to the brig. And during this exchange, we actually learn about a new feature in Mjolnir armor. An AI can ping a suit of Mjolnir, and if it's set to passive mode, it'll allow the AI to access the HUD and possibly other systems, which can be useful in navigating a new area or getting information from UNSC archives. Buck, of course, does not have his armor system set to passive, not wanting Leonidas in. It's a cool little feature, and I have to wonder if it's something that came about for Gen 2, or if it was present in certain marks of Gen 1. Also, is it a feature in regularly armed service BDUs? But these are questions for another time. In the break, Buck sees Mickey for the first time since he'd arrested the traitor. While Virgil masks their conversation with white noise generated from Buck's armor, the two talk, and it goes about as well as you'd expect. Buck and Mickey get into a shouting match over Mickey's actions, ultimately ending in Buck telling Mickey to rot in his cell. Though upset, Buck knows that they still need Mickey and begins working with everyone in the Condor to figure out how to get Mickey out. At the very least, they know that they have to disable Leonidas. Given that Leonidas has been added to the station only recently, and is known to have traveled with June or Musa on occasion, they figure out that he has a physical presence that they can disable, his AI chip, not unlike what Cortana used to use to get around. With Virgil's help, they figure that the only place Leonidas could be is in June's office on the command floor. Buck heads up there, but is soon discovered by Leonidas, who gives a general alarm, telling the Spartans on the station that Buck is AWOL, armed, and to be taken out with extreme prejudice. Ultimately, however, Buck is able to unplug Leonidas from the station. Unfortunately, to achieve this, Virgil cut off power briefly, which meant that the force field that kept prisoners in their cells had gone down, letting Mickey out, along with two others that were held in the brig. Buck rushes down to the brig, only to find Mickey holding the gun to one of his guards, the other unconscious, and the two other prisoners back in cells. 
Mickey puts the conscious guard in a cell and leaves with Buck for the Condor. But again, it's never that simple. Buck and Mickey are spotted and fired upon. Lucky for them, in the biggest instance of coincidence in this book, the Spartans shooting at them are neutralized, non-lethally, by the newly minted Spartans, Dutch and Gretchen. With their help, Buck and Romeo manage to escape the station, during which they destroy Leonidas's chip. As they make their way out system, June contacts Buck, basically asking what the hell just happened. Buck informs him in a I totally didn't just destroy a UNSC AI and bust a traitor out of prison sort of way. Buck then ends the call by informing June of a potential incoming Guardian threat before leaving the system. Okay, now we gotta pause and talk about Dutch and Gretchen becoming Spartans. As we discover later on, Dutch and Gretchen just didn't get along with civilian life to the point that they were about to file for divorce. The two met in the service, so it's not all that crazy to think they'd have trouble adjusting to each other in a civilian setting, even more so because Gretchen had been forced to retire when her leg got blown off by an insurrectionist landmine in 2552. But June approached them about becoming Spartans, offering Gretchen a prosthetic leg, and the two have been happy ever since. The part where believability is stretched to the breaking point is the two being on the Spartan training station precisely when Buck needed them to be. It isn't totally immersion breaking, but I did have to put the book down for a moment just to process such a twist. It's just a little too coincidental for me to easily accept. As much as I like getting Alpha 9 back together, especially with Gretchen now part of the team, this was a bit too much. Nevertheless, moving on, as the group slips away, Veronica informs them of their mission and where they're going. The planet is called Cassidy 3, a planet identified for colonization early on, but rejected because of travel costs associated with slipspace drives at the time. Around 2508, pirates and outlaws stumbled upon it and set up shop, naming the planet Freedom and resulting in a current settlement there called Hole in the Wall, after a famous location in Wyoming that was frequented by outlaws during the days of the American frontier. One of those outlaws was Butch Cassidy, incidentally. Dara goes on to explain that Oni had sent probes to the world during the war and discovered the colony. Rather than leverage it, the UNSC hid things there knowing that they'd be safe. Further, one of literally hundreds of plans if Earth was to fall was to relocate to Cassidy 3. Why? Because of the Forerunner technology there that seemed to keep the planet hidden from any and all known human and Covenant sensors. And seemingly this would apply to Forerunner technology too. The mission is to broker a peace and find out exactly how the Forerunner artifacts on this planet hide its presence. As Mickey hears this, he's horrified and repudiates any notion of being able to convince the URF of any sort of truce. The next several pages really get into the positions of the URF and the UNSC, both during the Covenant War and after it. Mickey points out that the message that Veronica intends to send isn't all that different from what happened when the Covenant first showed up. Work together against a common enemy. Of course, the URF wasn't too fond of what happened afterwards. Mickey further points out that the URF is likely to see this all as a UNSC problem, Cortana being a UNSC AI. However, Mickey ultimately points out that the fight against Cortana isn't a war like it was with the Covenant. Cortana had won the war. Now it was a rebellion, and rebellion he could do. Upon arriving at Cassidy 3, Veronica attempts radio contact with the planet, soon finding herself talking to Mayor Juanita Wells. After some brief introductions, she hands the radio over to Mickey to let him work his magic. And miraculously, Mickey manages to convince the mayor to let them land and talk. And I want to note that during this exchange, there's a moment that seems like it was written to address Mickey's change of heart from New Blood. When New Blood came out, a lot of people criticized Mickey going traitor, and in Bad Blood, Mr. Forbeck didn't avoid this criticism at all, addressing it straight out. In Mickey's eyes, he didn't change, the UNSC did. Mickey signed up to preserve humanity's way of life. When the UNSC started shooting at what Mickey saw as people just trying to live their lives, his principles demanded that he fight for that right. Now, like any good book, this doesn't go unchallenged, as Buck tries to point out that this didn't mean Mickey had to take him and Romeo hostage, that other avenues were open to him. And the conversation throughout the book goes back and forth like this, never taking a side, but providing a clear look at both points of view. It's great character building for Mickey and Buck. But moving on, upon landing, Veronica, Mickey, Buck, Romeo, and Dutch exit the Condor, Sadie and Virgil remaining inside under Gretchen's care. There's initial tension, but ultimately the group is invited to an open amphitheater to talk. In Hole in the Wall, there are no secrets. And like the rest of the colony, the amphitheater is a forerunner construct with human modifications. 
Talks are slow at first, Wells distrusting of the UNSC and Dare admitting that there's no promise she could realistically make for the long-term stability of the colony. However, Wells quickly realizes the truth of Dare's words. It's only a matter of time before Cortana discovers Hole in the Wall. Months, weeks, possibly even days, but it will eventually happen. And when she realizes this, she opens up, albeit begrudgingly. Wells reveals what they know of the planet's properties. A central forerunner spire, around which Hole in the Wall was built, generates something akin to a slipspace field around not just Cassidy 3, but most of the system. This field is thin yet dense, blocking incoming signals both in real space and slipspace. Unfortunately, because of their lack of experience with Forerunner technology, they hadn't made much progress in discovering the true source or any way to replicate it. At this point, Veronica reveals the existence of Virgil and agrees to leave him with the front in something of an exchange. When they are done with Virgil, the UNSC will exchange him for Mickey. Wells agrees, and the two parties head off to inform the rest of their people. On board the Condor, however, Virgil has discovered something grave. A fragment of Leonidas had attached itself to Gretchen's armor, and after a brief investigation, Virgil finds another fragment in Dutch's armor. The Huragak is able to extract the fragments and move them to a UNSC datapad, at which point they talk with what remains of the AI. Leonidas reveals that he had contacted Cortana's forces the moment they landed and that a Guardian is on the way. It isn't long before he's shown not to be bluffing. A Guardian appears over Cassidy 3, and before anyone can try to attack or leave, its attenuation pulse is unleashed, knocking almost all technology on the planet offline, including the Condor. Strangely though, Mjolnir armor and stuff like the ammo counter on UNSC weapons remains active. And here's where we get into some canon oddities when it comes to Guardians and how they work. In Halo 5, the EMP, as it was thought to be at the time, seemed to knock out everything it hit. Now in Bad Blood, we learn a couple interesting things about Guardians. First is that they can only seem to hit half a planet at a time, so the attenuation pulse doesn't circle around the planet. It essentially works how light works. Anything in its path will block it, at least to some degree. This part is straightforward and doesn't really change anything. The second major discovery is where the problem appears with stuff like Mjolnir armor and weapon displays being unaffected. The question is why? It's not due to any potential Forerunner upgrades, as we know from Warfleet that the attenuation pulse can affect Forerunner technology. My best guess is maybe the pulse is only designed to take out major power sources, such as the power plants for cities and regions, power cells for transportation, etc. We do see that after the pulse hits, two data pads Alpha 9 has are functional, but it's unclear if this is because they were unaffected or if Virgil fixed them. Hopefully Halo Infinite or some other future media can clarify. Anyway, with Guardian overhead, Mayor Wells reacts pretty much how you'd expect, blaming Dare and Alpha-9 for bringing the Guardian threat to their doorstep. And to be fair, she is technically right. Still, Dare points out that they can still try to evacuate some of the population, the rest having to lay down and surrender to Cortana for the time being. While Virgil works on powering up the small fleet that the Innies had, a group of broadsword fighters would draw the Guardian away. The plan ultimately works at the cost of all the fighters, and as soon as they're down, the Guardian turns back towards Hole in the Wall. To save what remains of the colony, they activate Leonidas and have him contact the Guardian so Hole in the Wall can surrender. Leonidas manages to contact the Guardian and relay the message. Forerunner soldiers that had been pouring in from Genesis return to the Forerunner planet. With Armagers gone, a Durance note is deployed from the Guardian to retrieve Leonidas. For anyone unfamiliar with the Forerunner saga, a Durance is a type of storage unit used to contain memories and personality impressions of a person. Basically, the human equivalent of an AI core in many ways. We actually see one in Spartan Ops. Though the way this Durance node is described in the book, it's notably different from what we saw in Spartan Ops. Leonidas' datapad is placed on the node and the node begins to return to the Guardian. As soon as it does, everyone piles into the Condor and books it. On their way out, Romeo shoots the data pad, finally killing Leonidas. As they make for space, the Guardian shoots at them with its converging beam cannons. But they are all too soon caught in another hit from the Guardian's attenuation pulse and fall back towards Cassidy 3. Luckily, with some masterful work by Virgil, they reignite the Pelican's engines and escape. Once back on Infinity, Dare runs off to debrief Lasky, Dutch and Gretchen run off for some personal time, and Mickey is afforded a non-optional security escort. Later, Buck finds himself in the Full Moon Bar, a spot frequented by Spartans, catching up with Vale, Tanaka, and Locke. Romeo, Dutch, and Gretchen soon enter, grabbing a table and laughing it up, but the room falls silent when Mickey enters. 
Though Buck briefly relishes the discomfort Mickey is in, he eventually offers Mickey a seat and introduces him to Locke. Not long after, Dare enters the bar, and a moment I think a lot of ODST fans have been waiting for finally happens. Veronica and Buck get married. And God is it perfect for these characters. They have a typical Buck-Veronica conversation which circles around a marriage, and rather than one of them popping the question, Veronica dares Buck to marry her. And just to, to top it off, Roland oversees the ceremony, which is basically the 2558 version of signing a marriage license in a county clerk's office. New Blood had left Buck and Darren a strong, non-marital relationship, which felt perfect for them. But if they were going to get married, I could think of few better circumstances and no better way for it to happen. The book comes to a close with Buck once again leading Alpha 9, meaning Romeo, Dutch, Gretchen, and Mickey on a planet of red and blue. Basically, the cover art. And while it's sad to see Osiris pretty much broken up, I won't lie that having Alpha 9 back together brought a huge grin to my face. And that, Canaanites, is Halo Bad Blood. What a fantastic follow-up to New Blood and a great first look at a post-Halo 5 galaxy. New Blood was generally well-received, but left fans scratching their heads or upset over certain story beats. While not everything could ever be addressed, I'm glad Matt Forbeck took this opportunity to flesh out in more detail why Mickey betrayed Alpha 9 and the impact that betrayal left. I don't think it will satisfy everyone's complaints and criticisms, but for me, it made Mickey's turn that much more believable. Of course, I never really had an issue with Mickey going traitor, so take my words how you will. The big positive in this book, however, was the look at a post-Halo 5 state of the galaxy. The characters hop around from location to location, giving what I would call a well-rounded look at how the created uprising affected the galaxy. It certainly still paints Cortana's actions as horrific, but I love directly seeing the fallout. I think a number of people can agree that the created storyline itself isn't inherently a bad idea, it was just poorly executed and presented in Halo 5. For me at least, and take this with a big grain of salt since I gave Halo 5 a 9 out of 10 initially and a 7 out of 10 later, it made me more excited for where the created storyline could go than I felt since my deep dive into Halo 5 two years ago. Like with New Blood, Forbeck expertly captures the essence of Buck and the rest of Alpha 9. Sadly, the book isn't without its drawbacks. There are some extremely convenient coincidences used to, as the book says, get the band back together, that felt a little too forced and took me out of the story briefly. And as much as I like seeing Alpha 9 back together, I can't say it doesn't strike me as odd that this book is a follow-up to a story written to free up Buck for his involvement with Osiris in Halo 5, whose underlying purpose seems to be to break up Osiris. Still, overall, Bad Blood was a fun follow-up to New Blood, though I think the latter is a better story. So with that, I give Halo Bad Blood an 8 out of 10. Also, with the band back together, I'd love to see 343 or some other studio take advantage of Halo 5's engine and craft an ODST-esque sequel, following the now-augmented Alpha 9 and using Halo 5 squad and co-op mechanics. Hopefully I'm not alone in that regard. So what did you all think of Bad Blood? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and thank you more for your patience. This has been Halo Cannon, and I'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider subscribing, and if you really love me, hit that notification bell and leave a thumbs up. These both really help out the channel. I wouldn't be where I am now without your views and support, so once again, thank you. Keep on being awesome, Cannonites.